Hebrews 6. Welcome to all our visitors, wherever you're, fra wherever you're from, all over the United States and around the world. May the Lord touch you in your visit here today. We appreciate you honoring us with your presence. Now we pray the Lord touch you by his word. Hebrews, the sixth chapter, beginning to read verse 13 through 20. And when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath of confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. My message is taken from this next verse, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Heavenly Father, illuminate the scripture to us this afternoon. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart, Lord, that is open. Open up our hearts to receive. Lord, give me a clear vision of what you're trying to speak to this congregation today. Lord, let the oil of the Holy Spirit run over my whole body. Lord, my spiritual body, my physical body, let, let the oil of the Holy Ghost come forth. Lord, there's no devil in hell can stop the word that you have prepared. We take your authority over every demon power, every opposition of tiredness, weariness. Lord, let there be a freedom now to hear and preach the word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Every ship needs an anchor. Now, Life is likened to an ocean. Sometimes it's calm, just as smooth as glass, soft breezes. The sails are filled with those winds, and it's just beautiful. Blue sky, white sails. But then there are also storms, and there are hurricanes. And God help you if you're on the water in one of those kind of storms. <clears throat> We're all likened, according to the scripture, to ships on this ocean of life. Why would God say that there's an anchor if we weren't a ship? Now, if, folks, the Bible likens us to many things. We're likened to sheep, and uh, we're likened to children. We're likened to those traveling through a wilderness, and uh, many, many illustrations of what life is like. But in this passage and in this truth that the Holy Spirit is trying to reveal to us this afternoon, we are likened to ships that are out on an ocean of life, of society. It's just one great ocean, and you and I are ships cast into that great ocean. Joe, uh, Jude spoke of the wicked as raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Isaiah the prophet said, the wicked are like the troubled sea that can't rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. Folks, we're all on a ship. You're ha you have a ship, I have a ship. We're all on our own ship. We are ships cast out on this ocean of life, and the storms are coming. Not only are there storms coming, and many of you are in that storm right now, but folks, I'm telling you there's a hurricane coming. An incredible hurricane that's going to stir the society. You talk about the waves that are going to roll the winds that are going to blow, the thunder and the lightning of society beyond anything we have ever known. You look around you today, look at all the ships around you. Look at the people, picture them as ships. And if you could just look into their heart, you would see nothing but storms all around you. You would see people that are driven by winds of lust and covetousness, broken homes, broken marriages, children that are on drugs and alcohol, you would see unrest. Folks, people are able to hide those things. But if you could see, the heart is like a troubled sea. And their boat is tossing and turning. There's hardly anybody. I, someone told me the other day, in fact, a pastor 
said that he read an article. This, this has to do with not just ministers who are evangelical, but the whole, all of the ministry in the United States that over 50% of pastors are on Prozac to settle their nerves because of the troubled waves and, and oceans and uh, all of the winds and tempests that they're involved in, in their ministry. And if it's that way in the ministry, what's it like in the congregation? Folks, the people that you work with hide it. They don't tell you everything. And what they do tell you is only just the tip of the iceberg. There are, their ships are leaking. Many of them have been shipwrecked. Their lives are shipwrecked. My goodness, even in the White House, they tell us now that there are some 15 or 20 workers in the White House that have drug backgrounds. And it's all over the United States, here on Wall Street. During that 160-point that, uh, drop the other day, New York Times said that as soon as the bell rang, they all went to the bars and went to their uh, cocaine and tried to drown all their troubles. It was a hectic day, and so they're going to go out now and drown it. Their, their ships are just tossing and turning and leaking and hitting the rocks and shipwreck on every side. What do you see around you? Maybe your own relatives. What kind of uh, turmoil do you see in their lives and in their homes? Jesus put it very strongly. Men's hearts will fail them for fear for looking after those things that are coming on the earth. Last week, a 747 jetliner, TWA, just five, ten miles off the coast of Long Island, was blown out of the sky. Probably, they, they believe now, by a bomb that was somehow planted on that plane. And 200, what, 230-some bodies were blown, and, and they say some of them drowned in in the, the waters when they came down. <clears throat> and they were searching, and there was a flotilla of boats covering, a, combing a 200-mile square radius, trying to find, you know, hoping for survivors and picking up bodies and pieces of the airliner. But in the third day, I think it was the second or third day, remember that storm that came? And I was listening to the radio, and. Uh, they were talking to some of the boats that were coming in the boats. They had hundreds of boats, a whole flotilla everywhere. It's just, just like a picture of society. Everyone out in their boats. Uh, and, and they were coming in because the waves were too high and, and they couldn't operate. Even the big boats couldn't operate. They had eight and ten foot swells, eight and ten foot waves. And almost everybody, could, they, they said they were coming off their boats vomiting. Everybody was sick, with it, except a handful. And many of these were volunteer firemen and policemen, and they were out there. And really, they were, the storm was not that bad. It was only 8 to 10 feet swells, but it had a hurricane hit. The big problem would not have been the survivor, or, or rather the bodies, the boats themselves. Those who were rescue boats would have been in great danger because you get enough swells, you get it high enough, and you get it wild enough and the rescue boats couldn't even make it. The water saw thee, O God. The water saw thee, and they were afraid. The depths also were deeply stirred. Beloved, even the unconverted, the atheists, are, are at their wit's end. They can't comprehend what's, what's happened to this society of ours. They look at the waves and the winds. I was listening on the radio the other day to a news program, and right after that there was one of these, uh, he wasn't uh, a racist commentator, but the man is known to be atheistic and, and very liberal. And his, his words were something like this. He said, what's happened to our nation? We have lost our moral compass. He said, it's hopeless. He, he said, our young people, he went on and on. This man, absolutely hopeless. Even the atheist now, the, the atheist. You know, you know in, in today's New York Times, in, in the magazine section, there's an article there where they're saying even atheists and even the most liberal are joining together now with the pro-lifers on one issue, and that has to do with euthanasia. Because in, in the Netherlands, they, 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 they voted it legal for assisted suicide. 
As soon as they voted for that, in came euthanasia. In other words, you, if you have a mother that's sick or, or uh, on, on a life support system, you don't have to have her permission. You can instruct that she be killed. Take off the life support without her, and it's euthanasia. Now they're moving in this direction, according to this article. They're moving now in this direction for those who have emotional problems. Emotional problems. Teenagers who can't handle life are going to go, be able to go to a doctor in the Netherlands if this passes. In fact, it, 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 it intimates that it's already there. A teenager can handle life and may be thinking of suicide, can have an assisted suicide. And now it has so aroused the liberal community, even those that are, are in the abortion uh, field, rising up together now and saying, we have gone too far. This is too much. It amazes me that they can kill babies and then stand up like this, but at least that's something. But it tells us of the turmoil of our society today, absolute turmoil on all sides. That these would, would, would say, who, who don't even have God, atheistic, what's happening to us? 19-year-old boy rapes and murders three women in this city, and at his arraignment, he says, I feel no guilt. I feel no shame. I feel nothing. He said, in fact, but the, the story is gruesome, folks, and it's been in the papers. I'm not telling you anything that, that hasn't been publicized, but he took her by the hair and sent to park one lady, banged her head against the rocks, then put her on the ground and pushed her head in the dirt. And he said, it gave me a sense of power. 19-year-old boy, what has happened to our society that our kids, our teenagers can kill left and right, have no feelings whatsoever, in fact, feel good about it? You tell me the storm hasn't come? You stop and think for a minute about how troubled and turbulent our society has become just in the past five years all over the world. The Serbians, the Serbs killed multiplied thousands of non-Serbs. And you know what they called it? A cleansing. Ethnic cleansing. What a word to put. We are cleansing our society. Thousands were murdered, thrown, heaped into graves with, with, with bulldozers digging holes. And, and those bodies are being assumed right now over there. And, and they're finding something so gruesome it's hard to explain. Incredible. In the British Isles, a man takes a gun, he goes into a gymnasium and opens fire to innocent little children, kindergarten kids, and kills over 20 because he was fired for incompetence. Oklahoma City, a disgruntled American soldier, blows up a federal building, and he still doesn't acknowledge that it was wrong. Hundreds of gays are flocking to Hawaii to get married. Men with men, women with women, and now crying to be able to adopt children. It's quite an awesome picture, frightening picture to see. Dozens of lesbians and gays embracing and having said their vows to life do us part. You talk about a nation that's lost its moral compass. How about this? Our Congress is just about to cut food stamps for, whole, for, for, for children. A deep cut in food stamps. Well, at the same time, a basketball player gets $123 million a year. Two and a half million dollars a game. And he wanted more. People out here scrounging in the garbage. What 
what kind of a society is this? What's happening? We just sit back and let it happen and we, we, we just seem to think, well, it's just going to pass. No, it's not going to pass. Folks, it's going to get worse. The storm is coming. The clouds are getting darker and the lightning and thunder is coming. A hurricane's on the way. Paul the Apostle was on a ship bound for Italy and a storm broke out. Now, they started out beautifully. The Bible said a soft wind carried them. That must have been a sight of the blue-green Mediterranean, a nice ship with beautiful white sails, 276 people on board, and, and it just smooth sailing. But the Bible said a great uh, storm, a great tempest of wind called Euryclidon came, and the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, so we let her drive. The ship was exceedingly tossed with a tempest. And when neither sun nor stars, there were no stars, when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay upon us, Paul said, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. I want you to listen to these words of Paul the Apostle. No sun, a raging tempest, exceedingly tossed, and no hope that we should be saved. Now, that perfectly describes our society. That perfectly describes where we're at right now. The sun is darkening. That sun of innocence, that sun of happiness that used to be here in this nation, and now drugs on all sides, murder, raping, incest, on and on and on, and the clouds move in. And the winds begin to blow, a raging tempest, exceedingly tossed. And no hope that we should be saved. Folks, the people outside these doors have lost hope. They don't have hope. The Bible said, we sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Paul said they have no hope. This is a perfect description of the condition of our American society where people have lost hope. <clears throat> Popular musicians are dropping dead left and right from drug overdoses. Just had another popular uh, young man, a drummer, die of overdose. Kurt Cobain, who took an overdose, very popular among the cultic rockers, died of an overdose. Still in his 20s, I believe. And his wife was asked, why would he do it? And she said, very simple. Kurt gave up hope. He said, there was nothing to live for. Multimillionaire, millions of fans, everything physically, materially that he could have or desire. And he said, it's hopeless. There's no hope. And she said, he preferred to die. He wanted to die because now death is the ultimate trip for this society, the ultimate trip. I read a review yesterday in a newspaper of a movie that's out right now, very popular among, uh, in fact, it's gathering a, a cult, uh, gathering a, a cult following, and it's called Train Spotting. And it's, about, it's a story of some Scottish heroin addicts. I think three or four heroin addicts. And basically, it's the story of how they're really glorifying the, the drug culture, according to the review. And, and it's, it's a, a picture of the guttural hopelessness of the whole youth culture in Scotland. And a writer was asked, why all of your young people are going to heroin and cocaine, and why is your society glorifying it now? And really, those who are dying are the heroes, and making it some great thing to be a drug addict. And let me repeat to you what he said. In Scotland, we're beating up our bodies, we call them our outer children, to show the bitterness and hopelessness of life. We do it to show that there's no hope. No hope. Beloved, I want to tell you something. Every ship needs an anchor. Without an anchor, your ship is going to be driven 
into the rocks and is going to be destroyed. Paul, uh, Paul's ship was nearing land. In fact, the soldiers sensed that they were nearing land and they started sounding the depths and it, it got, uh, uh, shallower and shallower and they were afraid they were going to hit the rocks. The Bible said, then fearing lest we should have fallen upon the rocks, they cast out four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. And that night, while they're anchored, they were safe, the winds were blowing, but they knew the ship would not hit the rocks. In the middle of the night, God came to Paul and said, the ship's going to be wrecked, but everybody will be saved. All 276 aboard are going to be saved. Tell everybody to eat a good meal. They're going to need the strength. He gets up and preaches his positive message of hope, and they eat, and they wait for the morning. And in the morning, the scripture says they took up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea, they loosed the rudder bands, they hoisted the mainsail, and they made toward shore, and they ran the ship aground. They ran it right into the rocks. It began to break up. The winds were still howling. The storm was still on. Everybody jumped overboard, grabbed a, uh, a piece of the ship, and paddled into shore. All 276 were saved. The point of that whole story is that when that boat was anchored, it was in no danger. Now, God had to get Paul ashore. That was the purpose. But when there is an anchor, the ship is able to stay and not be broken up by the winds and the waves. Now, if you want to see a mighty anchor, a real anchor, go down here uh, at the pier around 45th Street. I can see it out my window. The I think they call it the Intrepid, the great aircraft carrier that's a museum now. Is that the Intrepid? Go down there and ask to see the anchor. The anchor is, is probably eight feet or more, and it's many tons, and it has to be hoisted. In fact, I couldn't even pick up one of the chain, one of the links of the chain. It, probably 70, 80 pounds for every link of that chain it has to be hoisted into the ocean. It's incredible. But folks, the anchor on my ship is better than that. I've got a mightier anchor than that on my ship. My ship doesn't go down, it goes up. My anchor doesn't go down, it goes up. In fact, the word anchor here in the Greek has a root meaning that means uh, a bent arm. So let me tell you what the apostle is trying to say. There is an anchor that every believer has that goes into the Holy of Holies, the Bible says, through the veil. Now read it again. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Brother, sister, this anchor doesn't move. This anchor gets to a rock and hooks to this rock. But you see, my anchor is invisible. Your anchor is invisible. And what it is, the Lord looks down and he sees this boat tossing. And he sees the storm coming. And you cry out to the Lord, deliver me. His hand comes right down, that bent arm, according to the Greek, and he puts his hand right under your ship, and he just lifts you above the water. And he says, let it blow. Let the waves come. Let the wind blow. You're in my hand. I've engraved you, he said, in the palm of my hand. which we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. When I was a boy, I used to love to sing that hymn, I've anchored in Jesus. Has anybody heard that song? I've anchored. It goes like this. I've anchored in Jesus, the storms of life I'll brave. I've anchored in Jesus, I'll fear no wind or wave. I've anchored in Jesus, for he has power to save. I've anchored to the rock of ages. Hallelujah. Somebody dig that song out and sing it here one day. Hallelujah. Does your ship have an anchor? Not many Christians have their lives anchored in what the Bible calls a rejoicing hope. In fact, the Bible refers to rejoicing hope unto the end. God never intended that we live in turmoil. He never intended that we live on the edge of our boat looking at the waves. He never intended us to be scared of the wind or the thunder, the lightning. Folks, I'm a little crazy. I love storms. I, my daughter, Bonnie, 
hides in the closet, and she can't understand her dad at all. When lightning comes, he's at the window. Says, Look at that one. Wasn't that beautiful? The louder the thunder, the more I love it. Because I see God's handiwork in it. I see God showing who he is. He controls all the wind. He controls the storms. Hallelujah. Don't call for psychiatrist. I, that's just me. <laughs> what is hope? The dictionary says hope is a trust and belief that your desires are going to be granted. It's someone in whom you place confidence. It's an expectation that you will get the desire of your heart. You expect it. You take God at his word. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. Many of you don't have never understood hope. You think you have hope, but you don't. Now, you have faith. You have a measure of faith that God has given to you. You, you believe all the word of God to a point. You believe all the bad stuff. You believe that, be sure your sin will find you out. You believe that. Oh, yes, you believe that. It puts fear in your heart. Godly fear. Wonderful. You believe the, the, sin, the soul that sinned, that shall die. You believe that. And you go all to the woes and, and to the judgments, and you believe every word of that. But when the Lord comes along and he says, I'm going to keep you from falling. When the Lord comes along and he makes all these wonderful, glorious promises, I'm going to be your shield. I'm going, he, this is the promise he made to Abraham. I'm going to be your shield, Abraham. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to use you. I'm going to give you a father nature and you're going to nurture people. That is where hope comes in. Hope has to do with the good things that God has promised us. I've always been, ever since I was a kid, a kind, a kind of a negative outlook on life. And, and it slipped many times in my early years, it slipped into my preaching. I always saw the negative side. You know, they say uh, an optimist looks at a half a glass of water and says it's half full. Or, 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 yeah, and the pessimist says it's half empty. I was always looking at it as half empty rather than half full. But the Lord gave me a hope on his promises. I began to look at his word. He says, if, if you're going to believe the negative, why can't you believe the rest of it? Why can't you believe I want to bless you? Why can't you believe I want to answer your prayer? Why can't you believe I want to save your family? Why can't you believe I want to pay your bills? Why can't you believe I want to heal you and bless you? I wouldn't preach this message to a congregation that's had nothing but a diet of prosperity preaching. But you see, this is not prosperity preaching. I'm talking about something far beyond what they're talking about. I'm talking about the good things of God, the blessings of intimacy with the Lord, the movings of the Holy Spirit, the stirrings of the heart, that you know His heart beat and you... You move with him and you walk with him and the peace and the joy of the Holy Ghost is beyond understanding. Well, glorious things that come by promise. He's promised all of that to us. He's promised to see us through any storm. No matter how high the waves and the winds. One day, God looked down on this ocean of life and, he, and it was a very dark time and he saw a ship. And on the helm of that ship was written, Abraham. And the Lord put his arm down and touched that ship called Abraham, and he chose it. And he said, this ship is mine. And he came to that captain of that ship, and he said, Abram, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to keep you. You're going to have storms and hurricanes, but I'll make you a promise. I am going to be your shield. Nothing is going to harm you. Nothing can kill you. Before your time, nothing can destroy you. No demon, no devil. I am your shield. And he made him promises, wonderful promises. And it's on those promises Abraham hoped against hope. His hope was based on these good promises from God that God would keep him. God would, God was going to bless him and make the father, him the father of many nations. And that's what he believed. He believed that no enemy had a weapon that could bring him down. He believed that no matter what the devil came at him with, that he would survive it. That he may be tossed, he may be 
in a tempest. There are times it might be scary, and that happened to Abraham. That little ship of his was tossed and turned for 20 years. And all God brought him through, he stood at the deck of that little ship, and he said, it shall be as God told me. And he believed against uh, all doubt, against all unbelief, he stood strong. And God counted that to him as righteousness. Hallelujah. He didn't bend. For God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater. He swear by himself. Who against hope believed in hope according to that which was spoken to him. He staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And one day, all the angels stood together when the harbor of heaven opened and in came that ship. Can you imagine all the angels they, they see? He's coming into the eternal city, that city uh, that has that, that no man could make, whose builder and maker is God. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have been there when Abraham's ship came to harbor? In fact, there's a song, Harbor Lights, likening life to a ship coming into the eternal city. What a victory it was. But folks, there was another time, another dark time. God looked down once again on the sea of life, and he saw another ship being tossed in a tempest. And the name on the helm was David Wilkerson. And he, he came down, and he looked at my boat, and he said, David, that's a pretty puny boat you have. You don't know where you're going. You don't know where the rocks are. You don't know when the storms are going to come. You need help, son. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put the Holy Ghost on board. He knows every storm. He knows where every reef is. He knows where the rocks are. And all you have to do from now on, David, if you will just believe what I've said, that the Holy Ghost here in your boat, right here, Folks, how many know that Jesus put the Holy Ghost on board your ship? You know it. He said, now, you don't have to be the navigator. You're not the captain anymore. You're not the captain. I'm the captain now. The Holy Ghost knows my mind. He knows the will. He knows where to take you. You don't even know where you're going. Folks, we don't know where we're going. We don't know where the storms and the rocks are. We don't have any idea. Oh, we got a lot of people think they do. They're up there driving, you know, navigating their boats, singing their song until the storm comes and rips up the sails and the rudder is busted and they're going in circles and the boat's tossing and turning. Then they cry out to God. But even then he comes and takes charge. And he says, David, I'm taking over the ship. Folks, I gave up long ago trying to navigate my ship. I get up every morning and say, Lord, where are you taking me today? Amen. You know what the Holy Ghost says? Don't be afraid of the wind now because the, the bigger the wind, the faster we go. Doesn't bother us. He just says, relax, David. You just fellowship with me. You just enjoy my presence. I'm going to see you through. Folks, it's a wonderful life when you give up. It's a wonderful life when you abandon yourself to him and say, I, I'm just going to enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to let him make Jesus known to my heart. I'm not going to look at this storm anymore. I'm not going to look at it. Because Jesus is on board. The Holy Ghost is here. He's captain. One day the Lord looked down. And the water is around Canada. He saw another puny boat. It was Carter Conlon. The Lord said, Carter, what you got in your hold? He said, I got a hundred sheep down there. Well, where are you going? Well, I'm a shepherd. I'm going to raise sheep. 
And the Lord said, no, you're going the wrong direction. It's not four-legged sheep, it's two-legged sheep, and they're in New York City. You see, he was navigating his boat quite well until the storms came. So were you. He looked down one day and he saw your little boat tossing and turning. It was okay when everything was smooth, wasn't it? It was nice. Everything was under control. You could figure it all out, but you knew exactly where you wanted to go. You had all your plans. Everything was set until the wind started blowing and the crisis started to come one after another. Lightning, thunder. And you saw, oh. This boat's not going where I thought it was going. You're driven by the winds of adversity now. Winds of lust and covetousness and all of these other contrary winds that come to our society. Some of you, may like those in a wheelchair, you say, oh God, do you know where my boat is? I'm in a storm. I'm in a terrible place here. Lord, did you forget all about me? No, he's not forgotten. He knows exactly where everyone is in a wheelchair, in every hospital, in, in every uh, retirement home, in every children's home, in every orphanage. Our Lord knows where every boat is. He knows every storm. He knows where the hard places are. And he has a like compassion for every one of his children. He knows where you are, ma'am. He knows where you are, sir. He knows all about your condition. And he's not going to let, if you'll trust him, if you'll just keep your hope in him, just say, I believe Jesus is going to give me patience. Jesus is going to love me through this. I'm not going to try to figure it all out. I'm not going to ask why anymore. Lord, send the Holy Ghost. Take over my life. Let the Holy Ghost come and direct my life. Hallelujah. For he commanded and he raised the stormy wind which was lifted up lifted up the waves thereof. They, the waves mounted up to heavens and then they went down again to the depths. Your soul melted because of trouble. You were reeling to and fro and staggering like a drunken man and had come to your wit's end. Now folks, this describes many of you that are sitting here and I'm going to close in just a, a few minutes. But listen, that describes you perfectly. You suddenly had adversity come at you. Some of you weren't walking with God. Some of you were bound by all kinds of habits. And you were literally on the point of drowning. It was overwhelming. You were in the storm of your life. And the Bible says, your soul melted because of trouble. You were reeling to and fro and staggering like a drunken man. And then you came to your wit's end. And folks, when you come to your wit's end, you bump into Jesus. I mean, he's standing right there saying, I've been waiting for you. I brought you to this place that you give up trying to figure it out. I've, I brought you to this place to show you my love. Folks, I want to tell you the most important thing God can give you today is renewed hope. A hope that God has made you promises that nothing in this life can destroy you. Nothing. I don't care what it is. I prayed for a pastor's wife uh, this morning. She's going into the hospital with cancer for mastectomy. But there's a hope in her life, in her heart, both her and her husband. The hope, was it was encouraging to me to pray for her because I sensed the great hope. And really the hope is this, I know my God is able, but if not, if not, I trust him still. The hope was there. She hadn't lost hope. Some of you have lost hope. You've lost hope for your unsaved loved ones, for your children. You've lost hope for your marriage. You've lost hope of, of, of ever uh, getting out of debt. You've lost hope. I'm going to tell you something. Let's talk about your debt for before. I wasn't going to do this, but I just have to stop for a minute. Yeah, if, if you're in debt and you're praying and begging God to get you out of debt and you're not paying your tithe, you're praying in vain. I'll tell you something else. I'll tell you something else. I know for a fact there are a number of people who come to this church regularly. And, and they, they go to the, the little bodega, they go to the little grocery store, and they put $2, $5 out on the numbers. And they're playing 
They're taking God's money and playing. I would tell you, you take God's money and you put it on that, you don't have a chance in the world to win. I mean, you've just lost all chance to win because you... And folks, I'm saying this lovingly. People wonder why they're not out of debt. They're not paying their tithe. They're not, folks, it's not because we're trying to increase our, our funds here or anything else. That's to get you out of debt. That, that's to keep the hope alive in your heart. You, you'll accuse God of not keeping his word and you'll be in debt and get mad at God. God's not faithful. Here I am. I go to church. I, I do my best. Oh, yes, but you're trying to strike it rich. Folks, it's gambling. It's plain old gambling. It's like the guy over here, Ninth Avenue, coming out of the betting parlor, holding his cards, and there I am right in front of him. Oh, hi, Pastor. I didn't say a word. I didn't have to. <laughs> like the girl I told you down here on 9th, uh, uh, no, 8th and uh, 49th. She comes to this church occasionally and she's a big a quart bottle of beer. She's sucking it and turns around and the bottle's right in my face. <laughs> <laughs> and she looks at it and looks at me. She said, but I passed out 200 tracks today. That's what she said. I passed out 200 tracks. <laughs> As if that justified what she was doing. Her boat's in trouble. Folks, hear my heart before I close. If you've repented, if you have hated your sin, you still might be in a struggle, but you say, oh, God, you've made me some promises that you'll keep me from falling, that you'll put a new heart in me that loves you, that wants to obey you and walk in perfect obedience in the righteousness of Jesus. If you have a heart like that, I want you to know God's not mad at you. I want you to know God's made a commitment to keep you. I want you to know that you can put your hope in your life and you can anchor your soul on that. Half of you think God's mad at you. And you can't, you can't enjoy Him. Well, God's been dealing with me about that. The, the need that, that, that I come into His presence and enjoy His presence. That I don't come with my head down. I don't come uh, as, as someone that's trying to appease Him, but I come into his everlasting mercy. I come to his grace. And I say, oh God, you've made me incredible promises, almost unbelievable. Folks, the promises he's made are almost unbelievable. You have to have wonderful faith to accept it. But once you do, it brings the rest to your heart. You begin to know his heart that he's not mad at you. I wrote a book once called, I'm not mad at God. But then I said, he's not mad at me either. He's not mad at me. Will you say anything I've heard? Don't listen to the lies of the devil. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. And here's the invitation I give you. You have to just not listen to the enemy at all. The enemy that says that you're unworthy or that you're not going to make it. No, we'll never be worthy enough. We don't come because we're worthy. But here's what the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. If you're here this afternoon and there's one area in your life that you have lost hope, whether it's for your marriage, for the salvation of a, somebody in your family, but there's one area in your life where you have lost hope or you are so shaken, you do not have the faith now to believe God's going to answer in that one area in your life. Whether it's healing, I don't know what it may be. I want you to bring that to the Lord and stand here right now. Now, you don't, if you don't feel like coming, that's fine. That's, 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 you can do that in your seat. But there are some of you have lost hope. I mean, really lost hope about even making it with the Lord. Some of you have drifted away from the Lord. You, you were really on fire, but you've drifted away from the Lord. Your heart's grown weary and cold. 
I'm telling you, He loves you. He's trying to bring you back to His grace right now. He's reaching out to you. Reach out to Him now. If you obey Him, He's going to do something very special for you today in this service. He'll do it right now. But is there something, some place, one area? I, I feel this so strong in the Holy Spirit that one area in your life where you've just, you can't believe God. It, it just seems so hopeless and so helpless. Up in the balcony, just go to the stairs on either side. And you can come down any aisle. And we'll wait for you and we'll meet you here. Move in close if you will. Please make room for those that are coming. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Folks, look at me, please. You've got to hear my heart. Take taking me so many years to learn it. So why not take it from somebody who's learned it and taken many years to learn it? That God truly has made a commitment to you. An ironclad commitment. He swore by his own nature because he could swear by no other one, no greater. He made a commitment to you. I'm not going to fail you. I'm going to be your guide and your shield till death. All I ask of you is you give me your heart. Give all. Hold nothing back. Some of you here up in the balcony main floor, when are you going to come to a place where you say, Pastor Dave, I'm tired of living the way I am. I'm tired of being discouraged all the time. I'm tired of being beaten down. I'm tired of the lies of the enemy. I want to enjoy the Lord. I want to walk in peace in my life. That's what he desires for you. He desires a life of rest. And peace where you're not in turmoil all the time. If your heart's all turned up inside, there's turmoil inside of you. Bring it to the Lord right now. Don't walk out with that turmoil, that tempest raging in your heart. What you need right now is to, the Bible said, lay hold of the hope. Lay hold of it. It's late in front of you. It's been told to you now just by faith. Reach out, take it and say, that's mine. God, you promised to keep me. God, you are with me. Hallelujah. My boat's tossing, but you said you'll make the storm a calm. Make my storm a calm. Settle the winds and the waves. Hold me. Be my anchor. Hallelujah. Oh, God, I pray right now for everybody in the balcony and everyone on this main floor and everyone in this church, me included. Let every one of us come to you now with great hope. Oh, hope that is steadfast and sure goes right into the veil. Oh, Jesus, stretch forth your arm now. Pick us up. Put your arm under us right now. Hallelujah. Hold us. Remind us of your faithfulness, oh God. We're going to walk in hope, not in fear. For I've not given you a spirit of fear, but love and power and a sound mind. Lord, I smite this fear, this anxiety. Oh, God, this restlessness. Take it from our hearts. Let a deep, settled peace flow over your children today. Now I want you to pray this. All of you came forward, pray this. There may be some of your congregation want to pray this. Pray it with me right now. Jesus, you are the captain of my ship. I give the leadership to you. Forgive me, Jesus, for my doubt and fear and my unbelief. I come to you, Jesus, because I need an anchor for my soul. Anchor me now, Lord, in hope. I trust you, Lord Jesus, to see me through all my problems, all my hard places. I know you love me, Jesus. Take the restlessness out of my heart. Give me peace and rest in the Holy Ghost. Oh, Holy Spirit, I invite you to come and take control of my life, my home, and my family. Go to Hebrews, the third chapter, if you will, please. Hebrews, the third chapter. I know you have your Bibles with you. Hallelujah. This really has a lot to do with what I've been speaking about lately, the coming panic. Hebrews, the third chapter. Let's read the first six verses. If you're ready, I'm reading from King James. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, 
Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who is faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he hath builded the house, he that builded the house hath more honor than the house. And every house was builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if, 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 we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing the hope firm unto the end. Heavenly Father, I pray that you speak clearly in me, to me, and through me. I pray that everyone that came to this service this afternoon will be moved towards you. Lord, that we will be quickened, that we would obey the word of God. The word of God would not go in one ear and out the other. We would not be looking into the mirror and then walk out and forget what we saw. Holy Spirit, anoint me, come upon me, let the truth of God find its mark in our hearts. For I want this message to go deep into my heart so that I can't just shunt it off. I want it, Lord, to lay hold of my heart that it really changes the way I think. Lord, we have to be reminded constantly of this thing that I talk about this afternoon. Lord, we, we have to be constantly taught and, and reminded of this, lest we slip back into fear and unbelief. God, speak clearly to us now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. On this, this chapter of Hebrews, uh, the writer is talking to us about two houses, the house that Moses built and the house that Jesus is building. And the entire chapter is a warning that those who believe that they are part of the house of Jesus do not revert to the unbelief in the house of Moses. The house of Moses fell through unbelief. The house of Jesus, the Lord declares, will not fail because of unbelief. God said that his son is going to build a lasting house and the gates of hell will not prevail against that house. Hallelujah. Now Moses, the builder of this wilderness house, the Bible says was faithful in all things. He never once wavered in his faith. And yet only he and Joshua and Caleb, three, according to the scriptures, maintained their faith. All the rest who came out of Egypt died with hard hearts full of unbelief. For 40 years, the house of Moses grieved the Lord, the scripture says. But with whom was he grieved for 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. The Holy Ghost said, I was grieved with that generation 40 years. They do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. For 40 years, they never knew God's ways. For 40 years, they erred in everything they did. God's saying, for 40 years, they provoked me to anger, to indignation. Now, now, folks, when I read that, I say, Lord, I don't even want to grieve you for an hour. I don't want to ever grieve you. How could people have grieved you for 40 years? They gave him lip service. They, they, they went through all the uh, motions of worship. They went to the tabernacle. They offered their sacrifices. But what they did was so sinful that God says... I'm going to tell the whole world. He tells us. We read of the unfaithfulness of this whole generation. We read it now. God holds it up to our faces so that we can see it as an example. The Bible says their hearts were hardened by belief. All their expressions of faith, all their talk about believing and trusting God was all in vain because they had no steadfast confidence in God. It was never built strongly. It had no foundation they, they, they drifted in and out of a superficial kind of faith and confidence in the Lord, but they never did set their hearts to trust God. Now, Hebrews, the third chapter, is an admonition from the very heart of God to the house of Jesus. He says, take heed, learn from their failure, exhort one another daily, don't depart from faith like they did. Don't depart. Now, you know, I, I, I've been thinking if if we could somehow, if we could take one of us, uh, I don't know if I want the job, 
But if it were possible just to think of taking somebody from uh, this century, from the 1990s, and project you back in that time and place, and, and you're there in the wilderness, now you're dressed just like they are, and, and, and somehow you just get lost in the crowd and they think you're one of the uh, uh, people that came with them out of Egypt. And you you get to the camp just as they have come out of the uh, Red Sea experience and they've been dancing and the tambourines have been playing and they've been talking about how great God was, who's like unto the old Lord, glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, doing wonders. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. You will guide us in your strength. Thou shalt bring us in and plant us. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Glory be to his name. You've just heard them sing and dance because they'd seen Pharaoh and his armies drown in the sea. They'd seen this great miracle. And now you followed them three days later, and there's no water, and they're at a place called Mara. And everybody is thirsty. The children are quiet crying and the mothers are concerned and the fathers are concerned because there's no there's no water, there's no sign of water, there's not a drop of water anywhere. And suddenly someone comes running from the edge of the camp and cries, water, water. And so you see the the husbands of the wives getting their water pots and running toward this little body of water, this little pond. Everybody's excited as if well, maybe God has answered prayer. And you go along and you get there and you hear an awful commotion by the side of the water because people, the men are spitting out the water and women are spitting out the water. And now there's an anger and some are cursing and saying, you can't drink it. It's poison. It's poison. Don't touch it. And thirsty people can't believe it. So they dip into the water and taste it. And everybody's spitting it out and everybody... Is, is complaining, and they send a delegation to the tent of Moses. And the, the word is incredible what this, you, you already know the story, but here you are in this camp. And you know the story, you know the faithfulness of God because you're from history. You can't believe what they're saying to Moses. They're ready to stone him. They're saying, you're a killer. Why would God bring us out here and abandon us? Why would God allow this to happen in our lives? Doesn't God care that our children have no water? That we are, we are going to literally starve to death. There's no water. Moses, we thought you had a backup plan. You had no plan. You have no plan at all. God has no plan. And you stop a crowd and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. God just opened the Red Sea. You saw a miracle. Isn't God able to do it? And you, you, you start, and, and a crowd gathers around you, and they're complaining, and, and they are angry, and they are sent back to Egypt. We've got to find a way back. And these people are angry. They're murmuring. They're complaining. It's three days after the Red Sea miracle. And you say, well, wait a minute. R remember when in Egypt you remember been hauling off barrel, wheelbarrow after wheelbarrow and cart after cart of dead frogs trying to clean up the stench and there wasn't a frog in your land? Don't you remember the locust? You, you could see that black cloud coming over the horizon and it passed you and it devoured everything in Egypt and there wasn't a locust in your land? What about those screams that night of the Passover the wailing and screaming, the firstborn of all cows and animals and, and children, the firstborn of every family, died in the middle of the night and you heard the wailing and the screaming. And not one of yours, not a dog died. Not a lamb died. Nothing died. And you're trying to pursue, they've forgotten all of that. And you, you, you say, well, see, look, the God that did all that, the God that opened the sea, you see those rocks up there? God can bring water out of one of those rocks. And everybody by now is laughing at you. Said, yeah, what's he going to do? Just take his rod and hit it? It's going to come out? And said, yes. And everybody's gathered around to see this crazy man talking. 
about what God can do. He says, yeah, and I, I suppose you go and tell us that God's just going to pour food out of heaven and we just go out and pick it up. Yeah. Yeah. They would think you're crazy. That you have lost your mind. They have seen all of this, but they don't believe it. There is absolute unbelief in their hearts. And you, you, you stand there and say, well, wait a minute. Has God changed in three days? Folks, you understand that every time God does a miracle for you, you know how long you remember it? If three days. Because you get in another mess, you get in another crisis and say, can God do it? Can God do it? We forget the miracles of God. We forget the blessing of God upon us and we get in a tight spot and we begin to murmur and complain once again. Then you point to the cloud that's hanging over the camp and you say, well, well, what about that cloud? Why doesn't it evaporate? Why is it they're shielding you from the hot sun? Because you know you couldn't last one day in this desert. There's no man that's ever lived here. It's totally inhabitable, uninhabitable, and you cannot live here. Look at that cloud that never leaves you. And what about the glow at night that keeps you from being in pitch darkness so you can't even find your way around the camp? And that soft glow over the camp. What about that? Well, that's, that's been there. I don't know where it comes from. They say it's God, but, but we're thirsty. You say to them, why don't you cast your care on him? Why don't you assure Moses that you believe the same God that did all these past miracles can do it for you again? You see, the Lord was trying to build a house with Moses. He was trying to build a house. God chose a people that he would take into a wilderness and he would allow them to go through difficult, hard, impossible times where human, humanly thinking, according to the human mind, it would be absolutely impossible to survive. You could not have told anybody before this has happened that three million Jews can go into a wilderness where there is nothing but sand and, and a hot blazing sun and serpents. And they would survive and they would grow stronger in a wilderness and God was going to test them he tested them ten times and ten times they failed the test and if you've been there and say around the waters of Mary say look I want to tell you something We, you know your God cares for you he saw you in bondage in Egypt he brought you out when you, you could not even make it you were so tired and so weary and by the way folks you know why God took away the straw he knew that they're going to have a tough time. They're going to have to be able to walk a long way. They're going to have to have the muscle strengthened. So he took away the straw to build up their muscles. To give them strength. That's right. I believe that all my heart. He was preparing them for what was coming. But God wanted them to believe. So how could even the elderly be so strong and go through that? Because they had been built up physically for this great task ahead of them. And you see, God was trying to build a house, a people who would trust him in all times, in all crisis, in all things, and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God had a plan for this people. He wanted to take these people into the promised land. He wanted them to become evangelists for all history. He wanted uh, the word of God, the New Testament would have absolutely been a story not of, of Hebrews 3 but it would have been a testimony for the whole world it would have been a testimony of what God can do God was working on a church he's trying to build a people they'll look at you and laugh and mock now folks Can you imagine the joking of these people when, when have, you knew what God was going to do and you begin to tell them all the things that 
your almighty God can do and will do for them if they would just believe them. And not one of them would have listened to you. You know the rest of the story. Go to Psalm 78 and I'll show you the rest of the story on these people because of their unbelief. Psalm 78. Uh, chapter 70 let's read begin to read verse 13 he divided the sea caused them to pass through he made the waters to stand as a heap the daytime also he led them with a cloud and all the night with a light of fire he claved the rocks in the wilderness he gave them drink as out of the great depths he brought streams also out of the rock caused waters to run down like rivers they sinned yet more against him by provoking the most high in the wilderness. They tempted God in their heart by asking meat for the lust. They spake against God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Yes, he smote the rock and the waters gushed out. The streams overflowed. But can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for the people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger also came up against Israel because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. They did not believe. This God says, I cannot work with this people. And the Bible Bible makes it very, very clear there. And down in verse 29, so they did eat and were filled. He gave them their own desire. They were not estranged from the lust, but while their meat was yet in their mouth, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down chosen men of Israel. For all this they sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works. Therefore their days did he consume in vanity, their years in trouble. Folks, listen to me, please. These people flattered him with their lips. They said they worshipped him. But they never had a settled confidence in God's willingness and power to deliver them in a time of trouble. Folks, you're going to have to have in the days ahead a settled confidence. You're going to have to have a faith. This, this provokes God more than anything else. For a people to be kept, I, I can look back over all my years, my years and years of the faithfulness of God, I can look back over as many of you in this church, most of you, all of you who walk in with God can say, God has never failed me. God has seen me through. And then, folks, that is the testimony upon which you build your faith for the future hard times that are coming. God who saw me through all these times is going to see me no matter what happens. My God will see me through. <clears throat> they limited God. Judgment fell on them in the wilderness. When they got to Kadesh, people gave up hope completely. This is the report of the spies and eight of those ten spies brought back an evil report. They're giants, they're high-walled cities. They're too strong for us. We're not able to go up against this people, for they're stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report, and all the congregation cried, and they wept that night. And the Lord saw this weeping people, and his anger was kindled against them. And he cried out to Moses, all of heaven cried like thunder. How long is it going to be before these people believe me for all the wonders that I've shown them? When will I find a people on the face of this earth that will believe me? Folks, if, if, if you go to Numbers, the 14th chapter, just quickly, please, the 14th chapter of Numbers, you get a little a good idea how what God thinks of his children when they indulge in unbelief. Numbers 14, beginning to read verse 26. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation? Now, folks, he's calling them evil not for adultery, fornication, idolatry right now. He's calling them evil because they have no confidence in their father. No confidence in God. It's their unbelief. They, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation, which murmur against me? I've heard the murmurings of the people of Israel, which they murmur against me. Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, 
As you've spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Now, go to chapter uh, to verse 32. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. Your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your wardens. He said, your kids are going to have to put up with all of your talk. They're going to have to put up with your horrible example. 40 years and bear your wardens until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of days in which you search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. Verse 37, even those men that did bring up the report before the Lord land died by the plague before the Lord. I believe those men died within the year. And, and folks, here's the tragedy of it. Here's, here's a whole young generation ha had to look at parents who were always down, always sad, always under fear, and always bound, not a day of joy. And folks, it was 40 years of funeral after funeral after funeral, one by one, two by two, dying thousands and thousands of funerals every year. It was nothing but death. And, and folks, I've seen Christian lives. Th th these are examples. These are types and shadows. There are many Christians, and their homes are just like that. There's a death, a pale of death that hangs over it. There is never any life. There's no joy. There's no happiness. Everything is wrong. Everything is out of order because there's no confidence in God. There's nothing but murmuring and complaining and doubt and fear. God doesn't take kindly to it. God says, all right, you're not going to believe me. I turn you over to your unbelief. God left them. They, he said, your carcass will die in your wilderness. And there are multiplied, multiplied numbers of Christians who, even now, some of you that are in this building, listening to me now, you're in a wilderness, a dry, empty wilderness. You have no joy. You never, you really don't know happiness. You don't know peace. Everything in your life goes wrong. Now, I'm not saying that everything that's wrong in your life is a result of unbelief. Sometimes the Bible makes it very clear that the godly are, are tried. Many of the afflictions of the righteous. But God delivers them. One deliverance after another. He starts pulling you out and he restores your joy. I'm talking about people who don't even know what deliverance is about. People who live in constant dread. You just don't like to be around them. I mean, they pull you down. Folks, I have literally walked into homes when, when, <clears throat> when we first came here and, and occasionally when I've had to go to, to look for staff apartments, I could walk in and sometimes I've had to walk in and walk out because there's a spirit in that house. There is a spirit, there's a darkness, there's a demonic thing that hangs over the whole house. I, I know when somebody's into devil worship. When I walk in, immediately I can sense it. And there's some of you right now, your home is not a very loving place. There's a spirit in your home of darkness. And it's because of unbelief. It is unbelief. God sees, I don't care if you say a word, it's what God sees in your heart. When God gives Moses a notice that he's not going into the promised land, go to Deuteronomy, which is the 31st chapter of Deuteronomy, if you will please. Deuteronomy 31. I consider this one of the most tragic sections in the portions in Scripture. Deuteronomy 31, verse 16. Verse 16, begin to read. The Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. He's telling them, your, your days are ended. You're coming to the end. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. This people will rise up and go warring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whether they go to be among them. They'll forsake me and break my covenant, which I've made with them. 
Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them. And I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured. And many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they have wrought, and that they have turned unto other gods. Now, look at me, please. You say, that's Old Testament. That's Old Testament. But Jesus is building a house these last days. And in Hebrews, the third chapter, we have the same warning. We are warned explicitly and clearly, don't fall into the same sins of unbelief that the children of Israel fell into. That's what I've just read to you here in Hebrews, the third chapter. Peter said that you and I are living stones. And of these living stones, he's building a house where he, in which he can inhabit, where he, he finds pleasure, where he can live and enjoy our presence. He also, as living stones, will build up a spiritual house and a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God by Jesus Christ. And the Bible makes it clear that there, there, there will be a people in these last days who absolutely live by faith. They are not going to have unbelief in them. They, they are going to be able to stand against any onslaught of the devil. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter if everything and everybody around them fails. They're going to be so attached to Jesus, have their eyes focused on him, and their faith is going to be so settled and strong, his house is not going to fall. I beheld, lo, a great multitude which no man could number, all nations and kindreds, people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, palms in their hands. The, these who were washed with white, th those washed, these have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, he talks about multitudes, which no man could number. So there, there is going to be, according to the Scripture, a people, a redeemed people, who represent the house of Jesus Christ in the last days, who are not going to fall. But it is to this people, remember, it's to these who are now washing their robes, and those who are getting ready and preparing as a bride. These are the ones that the Holy Ghost comes to and says, Today, if you will hear his voice, whose house you are, if you hold fast to the confidence and the rejoicing of hope firm unto the end. Then he adds this, we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. I put a hard question to my soul when God was dealing with me in this message. I, I, I put a hard question to my heart. I said, God, I want you to examine my heart. Am I preaching this to others? And do you see any unbelief in me? Is there anything that is... Uh, Wounding your heart. Am I indulging? Am I slipping back occasionally into unbelief when, when I get into a difficult place and when things uh, pile up? Uh, Lord Jesus, are you satisfied with my confidence in you? Are you satisfied? I ask myself that hard question, and we're to examine ourselves in that area. You should do that even while I'm preaching. You should be doing that right now. Lord, do you see any unbelief in me? Have I been indulged? Have I been talking unbelief? Have I been sharing unbelief with other people? With my husband? With my wife? Am I going around saying why, why, why? And when, when, when? When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith in the earth? Evidently, there's going to be a lot of people fail. Could it be that you and I have taken our miracles for granted? I don't want to ever take a miracle for granted. <clears throat> I have a whole list I go over every time a, a bit of unbelief tries to invade my spirit. I, I start with Nikki Cruz. And I said, Lord, do you remember? And devil, do you remember? David, do you remember? How God took him and he's kept him all these years. And then I go over a whole list of young preachers all over the country that came out of drugs. And I remind my soul of the miracle and then I, I start miracle after miracle. 
I, I talk about how this theater came to pass, and I talk about uh, Sarah House, I talk about Isaiah House, I talk about miracle after miracle, I talk about all my children serving the Lord, children called to preach the gospel. I go over this list and say, Lord, these are miracles, and I keep building my confidence and faith in the Lord. I remember his goodness. Called counting your miracles. Uh, let's uh, switch this scene now, and let, let's, uh, in our, our minds now, take somebody that died in a carcass, died in the wilderness, and, and somehow we're able to bring him back. Let's bring back one of these unbelievers who died in the wilderness in unbelief. And he spends 30 days in New York City, and I pick out 30 of your homes and send him to spend a day at your home. Because he's here for 30 days. And, and he sits in our services, and now he doesn't know anything about this generation except what he sees and hears in the service and being with you in your home and, and listening to you and walking with you for 30 days. And then he comes to stand in his pulpit before he goes back to his grave. I wonder what he'd say. I think I know. We, we had God's law on two tablets which we never touched. We saw them once and they were put away. We couldn't touch them. Two stones. You've got a word in a book that you handle, you touch daily. It's, it's inscribed in your very heart. And still you break it. He'd say, yes, my generation disbelieved God. We provoked him in the face of miracle after miracle, the guiding cloud the silver trumpets, the fiery pillar at night. But you do worse than we did because you disbelieve in the face of infallible books of, of an infallible book of promises that is completed. We didn't have it. You have examples of history. And in the face of everything we did, he said, you've got my example. You read about it. Look what God did to us. You have that example, you have the example of all history, and more than that, you have an indwelling Holy Ghost that we didn't have. And even though you have the Holy Ghost in you telling you what is right and what is wrong, you still doubt him. Yes, we murmured in our tents and we doubted God in every time of trouble, but we only lived in the shadows. You lived in the, you live in the reality. We were just the type, you, you have the reality. It's written in your Bible, but now he, your Christ, hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much more also he's a mediator of a better covenant established on better promises. You have a better covenant. You have better promises than we did. And you still don't believe. Yes, we flattered him with our mouths and we lied to him in our hearts. Yet you do worse. You, you assemble yourselves and you praise the Lord loudly. You shower him with flattering songs of worship. And what I've heard since I've been here, you retire to your homes. You permit doubts to flood your mind. He promised to keep you from falling, present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. Yet you don't fully believe that. Because if you believed that, I wouldn't have seen the unrest that I see in you. Some of you are not at rest, and yet you claim to believe his promises that he'll keep you from falling. We did not trust the Lord to take care of us. We didn't believe he truly loved us. We didn't believe that he would save our children. Time and again, he heard our cry when we were in trouble. He always delivered us, but we went right back to our old ways of unbelief. Our children saw us die and waste away, and they knew that we were dull and unhappy and miserable. They saw how hard our hearts were. And you have that example. You had it all told to you. You see it clearly, and yet you're just as guilty. I believe that, that he would... He would have to leave this scene saying, I don't see anything different in this generation than in mine. And folks, 
here's what the Holy Ghost has been saying to me. And here's what I have to have. I want God to so lay it on my heart. I want it to so grip my soul that it, it's my life. It's a, I am set in it. I don't want to be one of those guilty of this sin of unbelief. In any area of my life, when it comes to any, any kind of battle in my flesh, I want to believe God's word that he says, I will deliver you through the power of the Holy Ghost. I want to believe that. Whether I see it or not, I'm going to believe it until it happens, until it comes. I'm not going to try to work it out myself. I'm not trying to get in the flesh and try through my human power to try to make something happen. When God says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, I want to stand still. When God says, cast your care upon me for I care on you, I'm going to cast my care upon him and not pick it up again. When God says, I'll supply all your needs, I'm not going to sit up half the night worrying about how he's going to do it. God said it, I'm going to accept it and believe it. Folks, this house is not going to waste away in the wilderness. It's not going to have a bunch of dead carcasses. God's going to have a people that he's going to take into hard times. Folks, we are going into a wilderness. There's no question about it. We are going into our testing times. In fact, that's most of what my message is about, how God, though this, this is going to be judgment on the wicked at the same time. It's a testing time for the church of Jesus Christ. He's going to purge his church in these hard times. And out of it, he's going to raise up a people. It's not going to be a great host. It's going to be a holy remnant. It's going to be a people that have the greatest testimony that anybody can have. Then in a time of panic, you have that calm, quiet rest in God that nothing moves you. Nothing hurts you. Because once you die to this world, how can you hurt a dead man? How can you hurt somebody that's dead to this world? If you're dead to the world and the things of this world, you could lose everything that you have and not be touched. You see, in this house we have a high priest. Hallelujah. We have a perfect high priest who's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Go to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. I'm going to close shortly, but I want you to see this. Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Fourth chapter of Hebrews, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest which is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeding of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like this. We are yet without sin. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Folks, hallelujah. In these trying days that are coming, don't forget you have a high priest who's been touched with everything that you could go possibly consider, conceive and go through. He's been there. He's been through it. He's been through poverty. He's been through hunger. He's been through the loss of all things. He, he has been there. And he's touched with all of our feelings. Some of you feeling just a little weary because of the battle in your home or your job or whatever it may be. Some of you being harassed on your job. But the most important thing is that you don't allow the enemy to come in with unbelief and fear and dread. He's touched with the feelings of your infirmity. He knows exactly what you're going through. I don't want it said of me, how long shall I put up with this evil? Those who murmur against me. How long will it be before I find a people that will trust me? This uh, past, I think it was November, last November, a few months ago, 
God really began to deal with me. <clears throat> he, he was beginning to, to move in my heart uh, about what is coming. And I want you to know, friends, that I set my heart. You can ask my wife. I'm not boasting, but in the Lord. Nothing to do with human power, human flesh, or anything else. But I set my mind. I'm going to seek God with everything in me, and I am not turning back. I'm going to lay hold of God until he touches my life in a new and fresh and living way. Lord, you can prophesy through me. You do what you want. Lord, I laid down everything I have and all that I am at your altar. Lord, I want to die to this world and everything that's in this world. And when you come to that place, when you come, and folks, it's something you have to do every day. You go to God. Whether you pray whether you feel like praying or not. You go to God and you stay there till you break through. You go to God and say, I'm in no hurry, Lord. I'm staying here till you speak to my heart. He'll speak to you every single day. He'll speak to you. He'll encourage you. And then you get into the word of God every day and start building your faith because faith comes from this book right now. Not just reading scripture, but hearing it. And I, here's my argument with the Lord. said, Jesus, you couldn't do anything without your father. You could do nothing and you were the son of the living God. How do you expect me to do anything? Lord, how do you ever expect me to stand up and preach? Unless you tell me what you want me to preach. How can I do anything unless you show me from the Heavenly Father? Lord, I want what you had. And he wants to do that for every one of his children. He wants you to be totally dependent on him. Not on the government, not on your job, not on your pastors, but on Jesus Christ himself. Will you stand, please? Hallelujah, I believe God. I believe God. You'll be tested on that. Oh, yeah, I'm tested on it, but hallelujah. Bring every thought of unbelief into captivity to the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. For without faith, it's impossible to please him. And they that come to him must believe that he is that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Heavenly Father, I, I couldn't physically face what I believe is coming if you didn't put faith in my heart. And Lord, you've got to do that for your house. You said you're building a house. You're building a people. We are living stones, and you're using these stones to build your house. But these stones, every one of them, cry out. These stones cry out, I trust in God. I trust in God. He will not fail me. I come against the spirit of unbelief, doubt, and fear in Jesus' name. If you've been plagued with unbelief, if you have to repent for unbelief, if, if your unbelief has caused you to be angry at God and you, you say, well, I've, I've prayed and I don't see the answers. Folks, when you keep saying that, I prayed and I don't see the answers, that's just unbelief. Pure and simple, it's unbelief. Leave the timing alone. There's a Holy Ghost timing. God knows when and how to do it. Say, Lord, I believe that the righteous prayers of the righteous men are heard. And we know if he hears us, we have the petition. So I just rest and wait. Folks, you don't even have to look for the answer. Just start loving Jesus with all your heart and, and, and let him be your joy and your strength. And, and, and it suddenly one day it happens. It's there. It just happens naturally. It's there. Suddenly you turn around and say, he answered it. There it is. It's, it's just a normal everyday thing. It's, it's, it's not some big supernatural thing. And suddenly it's just there. It's happened. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. It's like like my 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 good friend who who wrote uh, they speak with tongues John Sherrill and he helped me with the book Cross the Switchblade. He became an alcoholic, and uh, while he was writing religious books, and he prayed and prayed and fasted, just laid hold of God, and he he just 
he just didn't uh, look for any big miraculous thing. But one day he, he said, David, I, I took a walk along this line. And he said, I realized that I hadn't had a drink in a few days. And so I realized it was gone. It was just a normal thing. It just happened. God didn't come and just hit him and throw him down into the power and say, get up, you're healed. Folks, God's got a million ways to do it. Just leave it to him. Hallelujah. <laughs> Balcony in the main floor, if there's unbelief in your heart. If you've been going through a, a shattering experience, I want you to come and believe God as you stand at this altar that there will be deliverance for you. Come now as even I uh, will speak. I'm going to sing. If you're backslidden, if you've grown cold toward the Lord, if you're not right with God, if you don't know Jesus, come and join these that are coming. Up in the balcony, go to the stairs on either side. Lord bless you. We're going to pray for you and believe God right now to bring you into a, to a place of faith. Simple, childlike faith in the Lord that your life would be pleasing to him. Your life cannot be pleasing to him without that faith. For without faith, you cannot please him. To have a pleasing heart, a pleasing life to the Lord, the unbelief has to go. The doubts and the fears have to be given up to him, surrendered to him. Come, as they say, my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. He made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved, and he that keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. He's your shade upon the right hand. The sun will not smite you, the moon by night either. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth even forevermore. The Lord said, I'm your keeper. I'm your shield. I'm your son. I'm all that you need. Trust in me. Trust in me. Would, would you pray this, pray this from the innermost part of your being right now? Just pray this with everything in your heart. Dear Jesus, forgive my unbelief. I see now what a horrible sin it is. How it breaks your heart. I want my life and my walk with you to be pleasing to you, Lord. So forgive me and cleanse me. I repent of my doubts and of my unbelief. Lord, I've doubted you when you were testing me. And it hurt you because you wanted me to be strong. You were trying to make something out of me. You are trying to give me strength. You're trying to make me strong for the coming days ahead, and I failed my test. But help me now, Lord, for all the tests that are coming, not to fight you, not to accuse you or doubt you, but to say, Jesus, just hold me. I give you my confidence. Hallelujah. Now listen to this. The Bible says we are his house, if we hold fast the confidence, the hope of rejoicing to the end. I got up the other day, and that, that joy didn't seem to be there, you know. And I, I took a shower, and I said, Lord, why do I feel a little down? You ever wake up in the morning, you're down, you don't know why? And uh, the Lord spoke so clear to my heart. David, you have no reason to be down. You don't have any reason to be down. So don't put up with it. Make your heart glad in the Lord. Just make your heart glad in the Lord. I refuse to let that lay hold of me and take root. I plucked it up, cast it out by faith, and began to rejoice in the Lord. Didn't feel like it. But I rejoiced in the Lord and was glad and had a good and wonderful day in the Lord because God had convinced me, you really have nothing to worry about. You really have nothing to fear because I've got everything under control. Everything is under control 
You have nothing to be afraid of. Hallelujah. You have anything to be afraid of? Not at all. Not at all. Hallelujah. Now, Lord Jesus, I pray that you give us the knowledge, the teaching, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit to go to the word of the Lord. And as we read it, Lord Jesus, let us apply it. And let us pray for the revelation, Lord Jesus, that will implant faith in our hearts. Because faith comes by not just reading, but hearing it. Hearing it in the inner man. Saying, that's it. I will not go the way of the Israelites. I will enter into the rest that remains for the children of God. Because some have to enter in. I want to be among the some that enter in. Hallelujah. Lord, I want to be part of your house. The house that you're building, a house of faith. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to turn around, say Kansas five people, and say, I believe God. I believe God with all my heart. I trust my Jesus. I trust my Lord. I trust him with all my heart. I trust God. I trust the Lord. See you at 6 o'clock for the prophetic word. God bless you. This is the conclusion of the message.